Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about capacity building for nonprofits with guests. Bill Buckner, Director of Learning and Capacity Building at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, headquartered in Baltimore. Melanie Tavares, Director of Capacity Building and a nonprofit support at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. And Tom Feckman, Senior Program Officer at the Community Memorial Foundation in Chicago. So thank you all for joining us. It's so great to have you. Capacity building is such a broad topic. Uh, So let's talk a little bit about what defines capacity building um, in in your mind, uh, because it is so broad. Um, Let's sort of go around the table, starting with Bill. And then once we've defined it from your perspective, let's talk about how you enliven that definitions with programs. So Bill, you mind leading us off here? Sure, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Um, first, let me just say a couple things about the Casey Foundation. We as an organization b- aim to build brighter futures for children, youth, families, and communities. Our work focuses really on strengthening families, building stronger communities, and ensuring access to opportunities. At least for me, as I think about capacity building, I view it as an investment in both organizations and people. Um, it's about supporting people to enable them to lead and create powerful organizations, build their competencies, such that their organizations can become high functioning and do the powerful work for youth communities and families that we need within communities as well as within the public policy space. So it's really about investing in organizations and people. So this is really about improving skills for a purpose, right? The purpose are the people served. So you always keep your eye on the ball which is the families that you serve. That is your center, that is your bullseye. And what you're trying to do is equip others to be better service providers. Absolutely, the, the results are improved lives of children and youth and families, and that's core in all that we do. And Melanie, you have a different target, right? Your, your target is more uh, geographically focused, and then you have you, you do serve children and families, but you also have other purposes as well. Talk about how capacity building unfolds in, in your organization and also how you think about the idea of capacity building. Certainly. So I am with the uh, Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. They're a 96-year-old community foundation. Um, last I checked, I think we were the 17th largest community foundation in the country. So we've been at this work for a long time in in a place-based environment. And I think one of the things that really stood out for me um, at the foundation was that they have a 20 year old, a 20 plus year old capacity building commitment. Um, So they've they've been investing supports and resources in capacity building alongside their grant making investments um, for a a fairly long time. Um, So I think what's interesting about our approach is that we've been agnostic, right? We're agnostic of mission. and, And the goal for us was to strengthen the, the, the ecosystem, the Greater Hartford nonprofit community and ecosystem. Um, and that's taken um, many turns, right, over the last 18 months or so. Um, I think at its core, it's been uh, a lot of technical um, support. So really looking to strengthen things like the financial management functions and um, to ensure that organizations uh, feel supported through executive transitions, strategic planning processes, things of that nature. But I think over the last probably nine, nine or 10 months uh, more recently, we've come to see that there are a lot of adaptive skills and supports that are needed, right? We, you know, nonprofits really need to start thinking about how to innovate. They need to start thinking about how to be more agile, um, change management, the ability to, you know, to manage remotely or think of, think of mission delivery very differently. So I think for us, we're also growing and learning along with the sector, um, but, but at, at its core, um, at the Hartford Foundation, it has been about strengthening the entire ecosystem um, in service to our community. And Tom, what is your take on this capacity building uh, question? Again, very, very broad um, idea, set of ideas. Uh, well, thank you again for uh, inviting me onto this program and good morning, everyone. I'm tempted just to say ditto to just about everything that Bill and Melanie said, um, because so much of it rings true to our experience. Community Memorial Foundation is a health conversion foundation. We were created from the sale of a local community hospital in the western suburbs of Chicago a little over 25 years ago in 1995. 
And so we are a health foundation. Our mission, our, our vision really is to transform our region, the 27 suburbs in the western suburbs of Chicago um, that we serve, that region. We want to transform our suburbs into the healthiest region in the country. And we do that through, you know, general grants programs and a number of initiatives. But one of the initiatives that we've had really since our inception is our capacity building initiative. And we strongly believe that our grantee partners need to be as strong as they can so that they can move their missions forward so that we can move our mission of transforming our region into the healthiest region in the, in the, in the country. Um, so for us, we do, you know, a whole range of capacity building programs and activities from educational workshops to an HR program to a bunch of leadership development work, um, executive coaching, all aimed at helping our grantee partners be as strong as they can be so that together we can transform our region into the healthiest in the country. One of the things that, that um, I'd like to grapple with is the idea of the never-ending struggle. Um, people sometimes get very frustrated because money is going in to these struggles and we never get a resolution to poverty, to racism, to crime, to disparity of various sorts, right? We can't even come to, to a understanding, a common understanding in this country of how you treat uh, children, um, let alone adults, right? So can we talk a little bit about that idea of what our expectations should be in this civil society space? Um, it seems to me that nobody feels that a business is done, right? If a business is done, they would fold up their tent and go away, right? Businesses just sort of continue because needs of people evolve. Aren't we the civil society side of a business in which we have to continue to evolve. There is this never ending struggle uh, uh, element to this because our needs evolve, right? The problems of society evolve. We're never going to reach a final finish line where everything is wonderful for everybody, but the actual process of service and interaction and building, isn't that what life is about? Bill, what, how, how do you see this, this idea of of how do we retain our energy in service to to to, uh, to cause? So um, it's a really difficult question, but an important one. One of the real important things in regards to capacity building is actually helping organizations to recognize taking some time for self to build within the organization the skills and capacities needed to do their work is not taking their eye away from mission but it actually builds and strengthens mission. And so I view capacity building as an accelerator to actually moving us towards the world that we're striving to be. So, so when you're making those, those, uh, um, those decisions on investing, and Melanie, you referred to this, right? Because you talked about the fact, and, and it was one of the things that really struck us when we were working with Heart Foundation for Public Giving, that sort of commitment to the unmeasurable, mm -hmm. right? That capacity building is so often difficult to measure, right? But, but certain funds has to go in because as Bill was saying, you have to cultivate the people who are going to cultivate the results, right? right. right. So how do you make those, those decisions between making a grant for a program and, and spending money on capacity building? Well, I think, we, you don't do it in a vacuum. I mean, part of this is that you're you're talking with your grantees and, you, and you're getting a sense of where they see the investment. And I feel like that's part of the challenge that, that we're also reckoning with. Um, you know, philanthropy has very often been seen in this much, much more of a patriarchy. You know, like we are telling you, this is how this should go. Um, and I think it's, it's, there's been a reckoning taking place now where we're actually spending more time asking our constituents, what is it that you need and how do you measure success? How do you, how would you come to us and tell us what, what number one, what your needs are and number two, what would be of most value to you in order for us to help? And I love the, I love the term amplify, amplify the work that you're doing. Um, and, and that's been a shift. And I think it's, a, it's something that is, it's not 
going to happen overnight. I mean, I, it's, it's going to take some education, not only internally, um, because we're, we're accustomed to uh, measuring outputs and measuring outcomes. But the, we're in, this is being invested for the long haul, especially when you're talking about trying to change systems and structures. Um, and, and yes, you will see some small wins, but you have to be able to recognize them and you got to be able to hear from the people that know what they look like. So for us, it's, it's about shifting that conversation a little bit away from um, this is how we'll know that we've we've invested the right you know um, tools and resources in you to what is it that you need in order for us to be able to recognize you know um, your growth and development. Um, so I think it's just it's, it's a shift and change in the conversation. I love that idea. Of, uh, Mel, go ahead, Bill. Mel, I, I just wanted to double click on something you talked about, which is this idea of relationship between foundations and our partners. The stronger that and trusting that relationship is, the more authentic the conversation can be, such that they're not feeling the need to have to present their best selves to us, but their true selves. And that's when we really can find opportunities to partner to do strong capacity building and often will shift from technical requests around financial planning to some um, more authentic adaptive skills that may be necessary to really move the job forward. Totally. Yeah, I, I would like to lift up a, a couple of things that Melanie and Bill said as well. I mean, I think any successful capacity building endeavor has to start with um, listening to your grantees and what their needs are. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it just doesn't work any other way. Anything that we've ever done that's been successful has started with a conversation, with a listening session, with a survey, with you know observations of what's going on in the world of our grantees and how we can help. Um, you know, lift them up and help make their work easier. And and I just I, I have to also talk about. Um, Capacity building is ultimately about supporting the infrastructure of organizations mm -hmm. that are going to power social change. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to have social change without strong organizations. You're not going to have strong organizations without, you know, really um, without people, without without leaders and without leaderful organizations. Um, and so, you know, like Melanie and, and Bill, our focus has, has been on not only listening and relationships, but on really supporting people, um, because it's people that drive organizations and organizations that drive social change. I love this point that you're all bringing out about the, um, the intel feedback, right, and, and how this actually shifts the power dynamic um, between your grantees and yourself. Because when somebody comes as a grantee, there is a implicit power dynamic in which they are asking for funds, right? In this particular case, you're being invited in to provide um, support that they define as useful. They define as useful. And in order for you to be able to provide that useful support, it starts with a question, what do you need? What do you need that isn't money? And then you can hear the stories of, of how they are delivering. And it's, it's really a, a shift that is kind of required. It keeps, does it keep you from getting a little bit too full of yourself as a uh, grant maker? Uh, Melanie, I see you're, you're smiling a little bit. Uh, what, would you care to comment? Yeah, no, I mean, I love the term partnership because I think in the end, we cannot, we can't do this without our nonprofit partners. You know, we can't do, they're on the ground every day, you know, um, in the community, taking care of the, some of the challenges that we don't even recognize. We, you know, oftentimes I think we're, we're operating at such a high level um, that, you know, we can see the data, but you can't see what this looks like in practice and where the nuance lies. And so, you know, for me, it, 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 it absolutely is a power balance because, you know, if we all know that you can throw dollars at anything, but if it's not going to get to the right place and if, and if it's not going to be utilized in a way that's actually going to be of value, then it isn't going to help you get to your outcome. So um, it is a partnership and, I'm, and I appreciate Bill mentioning it in that way. And Tom, do you also find that um, you are, since you are dedicated to community health and you are a healthcare uh, a conversion, um, does it does it help to evolve your definition of what that actually uh, includes? 
Yeah, I mean, we we define health very broadly, you know, not encompassing not only primary and behavioral health, but also basic needs. Um, so we fund, you know, a fair number of, um, you know, food pantries and homeless shelters and, and things like that, as well as domestic violence services and our FKHCs and, and mental health programs as well. Um, so we have defined health, you know, a little bit broadly because you can't, I mean, especially in times of COVID and in times, in the times we've, we've been experiencing this past year, um, health has to involve, you know, food and shelter and safety measures as well. You know, it's, it's really interesting to, uh, to look at these uh, various polls. We, we did a, uh, we just completed a poll in which we asked how many people have received capacity building support. And this is a select group of, of individuals who are very familiar with the dynamic with foundations. And uh, only half uh, have received some sort of capacity building support. And it begs the question, how do you measure success? How do you measure whether your capacity building work actually has the impact you intend? Uh, Bill, how, how do you measure success? So, um... First of all, I think I should step back and just talk about like three different levels of capacity building as we think about it. Um, there is the intensive and often expensive technical assistance consultation work that we sometimes fund for folks. And we use that in the most selective opportunities with the deepest partnerships in the areas that have the greatest need. Um, but there's also a really powerful form of capacity building that we support, which is peer-to-peer -peer and really creating tables for organizations to learn from one another. And then finally, and I don't want to minimize, it's actually providing folks access to tools, resources, um, templates that will address needs. And they have differing um, levels of impact. And the way in which we really measure the success of our capacity building is around surveying and talking to the folks receiving the um, services and really asking them, like, how did it result in impact for you? Once again, we tie everything to the results and we tie our capacity building to a result that's trying to be achieved. And so it's really about asking and then evaluating not one-offs, but the conglomeration of all the capacity building that the pool of funds serve the community in a better way. So you identify the purpose and then you offer the capacity building support in order to, to satisfy that purpose. Yeah. Denise Mullen um, uh, just uh, asked a really uh, great question. You know, very often um, certain nonprofits, certain nonprofit leaders have a relationship with a particular foundation. They receive grants and then they also receive capacity building uh, assistance. Uh, what happens if you don't have a pre-existing relationship uh, I mean, everybody can, can use um, uh, grants, uh, of course, but how do you get into a capacity building program if you don't necessarily already have a relationship and maybe you just need some help even before you develop a grant or, even you, or you might even need some help in how to write a grant? Um, how, how do you all approach that, bringing in uh, new people who are outside of your fold? I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, I think one of the, the ways that we've really encouraged um, the relationship building aspect for us, it, it's we, we try to create multiple touch points. And so I think to Bill's point, you know, we have, we may be offering workshops and trainings that are free and available to the public, um, but we've also cultivated over the last 20 years, we've cultivated um, some level of credibility, you know, between the staff and the community. So word of mouth is, is has really become a, a major driver for us as a touch point. And oftentimes when a new executive director is named, um, you know, they'll be they'll be you know encouraged to contact us at the nonprofit support program at the Hartford Foundation to see what we have available. And so we'll get the emails or the or the phone calls and, and our staff will actually just spend the time talking through what are some of the resources that we have available. Um, but I also think we're, we're trying to be much more intentional about reaching out and, and um, ensuring that folks that have not ever considered contacting the foundation um, do know that we are here and available. And so for us, that, that tends to be smaller, more proximate organizations. Um, so we're trying to be much more intentional about designing services and access and touch points and thinking through, you know, where are, where are they getting access? 
um, to the foundation and the foundation services. We're also, um, the nonprofit support program at the foundation offers supports regardless of whether you have a, a, a grant with us. And so you can contact us um, for support, you know, in any way, shape or form without having um, had a relationship with us on the grant side of the house. So, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's another way, it's another touch point and entry point into a relationship with the foundation. And oftentimes it's the beginning. Do you all ever do open call training in which you basically say, we're going to do a session on grant writing, or we're going to do a session on managing um, uh, through crisis or governance? Uh, do you do that type of work? Absolutely. Tom? So we're a little, I mean, we have certainly done those kinds of sessions, but for our grantees. And I think maybe I'm a little different than the other funders on the call in that we are very geographically defined. So we only serve 27 suburbs in the western suburb of Chicago. We have a universe of probably 80 or 90 grantees. So, you know, the, the simple answer is our capacity building work is for our grantee partners. Um, and, you know, maybe a couple others in our communities that haven't received a grantee or haven't received a grant, but are important to, you know, the nonprofit landscape, if you will. Um, but I really think the question gets to is really a challenge to funders. I mean, funders need to be providing support to nonprofit organizations. And while we're probably not going to provide a lot of support outside of our grantee population, everything we do is open to every grantee we have. Um, so there's no kind of um, tiers or, or strata, you know, stratification of our capacity building support. We also um, have partnered with other funders in Chicago on a couple innovative um, capacity building funder collaboratives. Uh, one comes to mind in particular around um, strategic alliances and, and mergers. There's a a group called the Mission Sustainability Initiative, which is housed under Forefront, which is our regional association of grant makers. And it is a um, funders collaborative that provides support to any nonprofit organization um, in, you know, really in Illinois uh, that is, you know, thinking about a strategic alliance and they can receive um, confidential support um, from a staff person at Forefront um, and receive grants uh, through a common grant pool that funders like my foundation have uh, put together to receive grants for, you know, to hire attorneys and consultants um, for a, a strategic alliance or merger. So there are ways in which foundations can come together to support nonprofits and support capacity building among nonprofits beyond just their um, geographic scope or their their service area scope. And Bill, uh, Annie Casey is very well known for its various capacity building uh, programs. Do you do open calls? So um, we would we don't do open calls in a very traditional sense. We do create things with the intention of how do we get it out to the world. And so I am always amazed at the number of people who come across and are utilizing within the context of their work publications that we've done on race equity, on utilization of data, on utilizing the data we provide around um, children's um, well-being within the U.S. And so we do create capacity building tools and resources and make them publicly available, and we do a concerted push to get them out. And even beyond that, like I say, I'm often amazed that um, people and organizations who are utilizing our tools that we have zero connection with from a granting relationship. Um, in addition to supporting conferences and other um, opportunities for folks to go deeper in some of the areas that we focus on. So I got a, a question from Kerry Hynonen um, about how often um, your organizations uh, see situations in which uh, partnerships amongst your various grantees might have mutual benefits and also mutual benefits for mutually targeted constituencies um, and, and that you use your competencies in the capacity building area 
to try and create kind of a, a, a rational um, uh, organization out there. Now, of course, the decisions aren't yours, right? Mm -hmm. These different organizations are um, leading their own, uh, these different leaders are, are leading their own organizations. How often do you bring these pe uh, people together though and try and, and see if there might be something that would benefit everybody, including mutually conserved constituents? Uh, Melanie, you want to give this uh, a, a shot? Sure, sure. I mean, I, I would say that the, the way that we've tackled that has been more so through cohort based programming, you know, so whether it's um, a cohort that's um, pulled together based on a, a, a specific part of the sector um, or a, a, a specific community or a specific need, um, whether that be an organizational need or a community need. Um, and then we've kind of allowed the magic to happen. I think that, you know, we've described it as that peer sharing and peer mentoring and peer support. It's, it's pretty amazing what happens when you have a group of like-minded like thought partners together in, in a place-based environment in a room um, over, the, over the course of a number of opportunities, you know, um, and, and as the trust begins to build, you know, among these organizations and they learn more about each other, they find opportunities to work together and, and be more collective in their approach. Um, and I think that that's really the role for us, um, you know, at the foundation is that we're more more so a convener, um, as opposed to saying, you know, like we've identified a couple of organizations we actually think should be working together. Um, now, it's not to say that, that those things don't happen um, because people make joint applications, you know, um, for funding uh, to the foundation. But for the most part, when it comes to capacity building, our role is just to serve as a catalyst. You're, in a, you're a convener, not an insider. Bill, do you take that approach um, as well at the Annie Casey Foundation? I, I would agree wholeheartedly. Um, it's about bringing folks together to do the good work, not being the person or people who make decisions around what organizations should do. That is not our role. And Tom? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a really interesting question because I think it happens on a couple different levels, right? I mean, one, certainly we have been engaged and provided grants to nonprofit organizations that have approached us because they were in some, um, you know, some process of merging or developing a strategic alliance. Certainly we've done workshops for our grantees on strategic alliances. So we have provided direct funding for consultants for those kinds of kind of high level, um, you know, interactions and even mergers. Um, but it's so much deeper than that. I mean, I think like the other funders on the call, we have we have supported, you know, roundtable sessions and peer learning circles and workshops and cohort based work where, you know, the the intent wasn't necessarily to bring people together around a particular topic but more to bring people together to support HR work or to bring people together um, for a leadership program or a board development program. And because we have, you know, highly skilled um, and, you know, wonderful executive directors in a room together, they begin talking and the result that happens out of that is often far beyond what the intent of the capacity building program was. Um, I'll give you one kind of simple example. We we fund a 18-month um, intensive leadership development curriculum sponsored by the Center for Creative Leadership out of North Carolina for a cohort of emerging leaders, kind of middle managers in our grantee partner population. Um, and, you know, part of the program involves um, – you know, an, a, a team learning approach um, where, you know, people are working together on a project, which becomes the vehicle on how they learn about leadership. And these grantees come from across our geographic area and from very different areas of the nonprofit sector. One, in one of the cohorts we did, one of the grantees was from a retirement community. One of the grantee participants was from a food bank. The food bank got a delivery, which you know, kind of out of the blue of a pallet of adult diapers that they had no idea what to do with. Um, but because they were in this leadership program with a nonprofit from a completely different area, you know, working in a, a retirement community, 
that connection was made and people who needed that um, those products were able to receive them. Um, so, you know, simple example, but connections are made all over the place in the the work that we do, so much so that in some of our programs, we've actually started evaluating and measuring the connections that people have made kind of between organizations and the impact that that's had on programming. It's such a it's such a great point. Um, we're we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, I'm going to go over to uh, Melanie, and I'm going to give Bill. You're you're going to have the last word. You're going to leave us with your with your pearls of wisdom. We finished uh, two polls. Uh, the first poll um, was where do nonprofits need the most support? And the two answers which got the most uh, responses were development and implementation of measurement and evaluation systems. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but perhaps also um, a, a little bit of um, uh, supplying funders what they want in order to get funding, a little bit of um, sort of um, a little bit of a, a circular logic. And then the other piece is infrastructure, IT in particular, uh, facilities. Uh, but if you take a look at those at those two areas, people are interested in, in understanding what makes their work effective. Uh, Melanie, do you, do you feel that, that uh, this tracks with a lot of your requests that you're getting? Absolutely, and I think we've made a, a major commitment to this over the last um, probably 10 years, I would say. We, we started many, many years ago um, a program called Building Evaluation Capacity, um, and it was for that purpose. And it really was to help um, organizations feel more um, a sense of control over their data, of, over what's happening with their data and how they're using it, and whether they're using that for, for their own internal continuous growth or they're using it to make a case on behalf of their constituents or on behalf of the organization. And over the years, I mean, I, we've, we've built up enough graduates in the, from this program, this cohort-based program, um, that it is now, you know, we, we're now looking at an ecosystem of organizations who are feeding um, individuals back into the sector, right? And so it's not just that knowledge is not just staying within a particular organization, but rather as people are moving around the nonprofit community um, in Greater Hartford, they're bringing that, that knowledge and understanding along with them. Um, and what we found at, at this point is we also now internally need to be rethinking what it means to have evaluative thinking as part of our process. And so we're, in the, we're now kind of thinking through, along with the help of, of, of our constituency and those who have come through the program, what is it that, that fuels us to become learning organizations, um, ongoing learning organizations? And, and how is it that we're using the data, you know, qualitative and quantitative? And what are we using to, what are we defining as data? And how does that actually become a value add for us um, as we tell our stories, as we try to make sure that the folks that are being um, supported on the ground actually have an understanding of, of what it is that they need in order to advocate on behalf of themselves in their communities. Um, so for us, it's, it's really come full circle um, but it's it's a testament to um, really that that desire to to have a better understanding and more control over over telling your story and being at the forefront as opposed to an action that you have to do in order to satisfy a grant requirement. Bill, could you uh, see us out? Uh, we got a response on some polling uh, that funders are less willing to invest in capacity building um, by fifty six percent than uh, on uh, on sort of pure grant making. Uh, is that your perception that funders are less willing in general to invest in capacity building? And how does the Annie Casey Foundation see that? Um, I do believe that funders are more interested in funding and programming um, because it's a straighter line to the results that we're striving to achieve. However, um, many funders recognize the need for strengthening organizations and strengthening ecosystems, hence the reason why we do make investments in capacity building. And I will just say as a closing thought, um, yes, investments in technical skills are important. So I don't want to under attend to data management systems and evaluative skills, but I also want to reiterate the importance of focusing on things like organizational health, focusing on things like um, increasing our ability to do emergent learning and learning from past experiences and strategic leadership. 
a lot of those softer adaptive skills are often the transformational things that will move an organization from good to great. And um, what we really need and the communities we serve really need are great organizations. And we'll only get that with effective capacity building. Those would be my closing thoughts. Great, great thoughts, Bill. Uh, Bill Buckner, thank you so much for sharing the work. Uh, your work as Director of Learning and Capacity Building at the Annie Casey Foundation in Baltimore, Melanie Tavares, Director of Capacity Building and Nonprofit Support at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, and Tom Fechtman, Senior Program Officer at the Community Memorial Foundation in Chicago. Thank you all, stay safe and uh, have a great day. Uh, do good work. <laughs>